Hey everybody. So last episode we talked about the bizarre maze generation algorithm from Entombed. Algorithms and protocols these days govern a lot of what we see and think and do, as has been the case since the beginning of the information age and a bit before it. Computers need protocols. A machine getting a big stream of bytes has absolutely no way of telling what any of it actually means, so it's up to computer scientists to build a system that makes things make sense. Take, for example, the internet. Uh, when people say the internet, they very often aren't actually referring to the internet, at least not explicitly. The internet is a bunch of computers scattered across the breadth of the earth and the lines of contact crisscrossing between them. But when you hear the internet mentioned, it's probably not in reference to this, but rather the collection of documents, videos, images, and other such resources stored within these computers and accessible through your web browser of choice. That is to say, the World Wide Web. The web is something so sprawling, so ubiquitous, so commanding in its presence, that it's easy to assume it simply has always been, intrinsically bound to the machines whose shells it inhabits. But that's not true at all. The web is yet another construct defined by a protocol, in this particular case, the hypertext transfer protocol. And if things had been just a little different in the tumultuous, dawning days of the consumer global network, we might not have had it today at all. We might have, instead, been using something called Gopher. <laughs> Now, before we get moving, let's make sure we understand exactly how the web works. At risk of grossly oversimplifying, the web and the HTTP derivatives it operates upon are basically just a way for computers to ask for things and get them. In its simplest form, one client machine within a network sends a formatted request for a file to a server machine in that same network, which is running a web server process that accepts the request, thinks it over for a bit, and either sends that file back chop them into tiny pieces usually, or responds explaining why it can't do that. It's just asking for documents. It's always just been asking for documents. Of course, these days you've got asynchronous requests and differing transport protocols and encryption and so on and so forth. But the ironclad foundation upon which this spire of systems was built is just the idea that one computer can ask for a file and another computer can serve it up hot and ready. It's not exactly an obtuse concept, and really the only reason it took until 1990 and 1991 for computer scientist Tim Berners-Lee and his team to formally design a specification for it was simply because the internet just wasn't complex enough yet to necessitate it. And bearing this in mind, it should come as no great surprise that while the HTTP web team was plugging along at CERN in Switzerland, another parallel project was well underway at Minneapolis and St. Paul's own University of Minnesota, the powerful new Gopher Protocol. Gopher's story begins, roughly, in 1991, when a U of M committee resolved to call for the creation of a campus-wide information system, or CWIS, for a quick access of university resources. Colleges had long been years ahead of the world at large when it came to the testing of networking concepts, and internet overlay information retrieval systems were no great exception. The university wanted, in essence, a custom-built system through which its computers could query each other to quickly and efficiently fetch files without the use of the beast that was FTP. After a great deal of deliberation, design of the system fell to a small university development team sourced from the school's microcomputer center and led by one Mark P. McCahill. And throughout 91, the group put in hours on what would, by the middle of the year, be officially known as the Gopher Internet protocol, a play on both the university's mascot and the colloquial use of the term for someone who goes for something. You get it. The protocol's original presentation to the college board, uh, according to team member Bob Alberti, was an unmitigated disaster, as the Gopher group had designed the protocol to operate over a client-server architecture instead of running off a mainframe as the administration had requested, and the university subsequently refused to see the project carried any further. 
Undeterred, developer Paul Lindner unleashed Gopher upon the Virgin Net at large in the hopes that the system could thrive on its own in April of 1991. And if one were to get their hands on an early version of the software upon such a spring morning, this is what they'd come face to face with. Gopher was, by design, simple and almost painfully direct. Structurally, it wasn't too far off from the web of tomorrow. One computer could run a Gopher server whilst another ran a Gopher client. The client could ask the server for whatever it so desired, so on and so forth. But that was about where the similarities ended. A sample Gopher session would go like this. The client opens a TCP connection with the server on a pre-decided Gopher port. This is how they say hi. The client sends an empty line, indicating that it's ready to accept information, and the server sends back a Gopher directory listing. This is where Gopher really stands on its own. The system was structured and hierarchical, with any given Gopher server consisting of a tree of directories that narrow down further and further in specificity until you get access to the specific document or file that you seek. Its type, of course, indicated by a simple plain text enumerator value at the beginning of its directory listing. For example, since I think one honestly might be needed, if I opened up my Gopher browser and connected to my favorite Gopher server in search of my favorite photos of uh, cool arches and columns, I'd click through to the directory for pictures, then click through to the directory for architectural photos, and finally be served a listing of photos for me to download. Each listing in a Gopher directory represented either a file or another directory, and served up alongside the listings and their types was a resource locator string that the Gopher client could send to another server in order to get access to whatever it was meant to locate. As something of an effect of how the internet worked at that point, and unlike the strictly regimented URLs of today, these locators didn't really have to conform to any standard at all. They simply instructed the Gopher browser to send this specific message to this specific server with the promise of being rewarded with whatever the directory said it held. Servers could also direct clients to other servers entirely, if needed. And that, in essence, was Gopher. And the people loved it. It's hard to describe the exact manner in which Gopher propagated across the net, because at the time, it really wasn't comparable to anything that had occurred in the preceding years. The protocol found overnight strongholds in universities across the nation, who accepted the system with open arms, and reached out with eagerness for the next updates and additions to be added. It's important to note that, at this point, we're still riding the edge of the internet's incubation period, so it just wasn't feasible for the meager 5 million global internet users, consisting mostly of students, researchers, and hobbyists, to send Gopher up the top of the charts in the way the future internet would be capable of. But let it be known that they damn well did their best. Within weeks, letters were being written into the University of Minnesota, demanding new functionality and future versions. And with this, the team was reinstated and instructed to work on the development of the official Gopher software package by the beginning of 1991. And so, as the net began to expand at a dizzying pace that shocked even its own long-term denizens and overseers, so did Gopher and its influence begin to spread with it. By 1992, as relayed by the team in years to come, hundreds of working Gopher servers had sprung up across the continental US, and more and more with each passing day, abroad as well. This was the great transitional period of the internet, from an epoch that had begun when ARPANET was first switched on in 1969, into one that we arguably still reside within to this very day. No longer was the net relegated to college campuses and sequestered within squat laboratory buildings. Everyday people were, for the first time, getting an introduction to this fascinating new technology. And by 1992, chances are their first encounter featured a conversation with the Gopher server. The infrastructure and community soon began to catch up with the excitement as well. November 92 saw a team from Reno's University of Nevada publish the first version of Veronica, a full-feature Gopher search engine with possibly the most egregious backronym for a name I have ever had the pleasure of coming across. 
Naming aside, uh, Veronica was a trailblazing piece of software and one of the most sophisticated search engines in existence at the time of its creation. Three months earlier, the first of many gopher cons had taken place in sunny Ann Arbor, Michigan, and the following four cons over the following four years would prove instrumental in strengthening the community and bringing about changes in the product's development. These cons were some of the first major enthusiast gatherings centered around an internet tech community. They drew crowds of not just hobby but interested university representatives, scientists, and big-shot corporate investors. Developers introduced their own gopher-centric passion projects. They had their own t-shirts. Al Gore was there. It was like nothing seen before. Browsing the internet's sprawling, decentralized library of extant resources was now, for the very first time, made organic and slick and accessible. And it seemed that more so now than ever, any new idea released upon the net at large would make its debut on a Gopher server. Including, as the story goes, a strange new information system protocol out of CERN called the World Wide Web. But we'll get back to that later. In 1993, Gopher's dominion over the net was, in a sense, codified when IANA officially designated the prestigious TCP port 70 as the reserved Gopher communication channel, which it continues to hold to this day, closer to ground level than the bastions of HTTP and HTTPS on ports 80 and 443, respectively. By this point in time, it was estimated that close to 7,000 Gopher servers were actively maintained across the globe, far greater in number than any competing standard, and attaining a record high of roughly one Gopher server for every 1,400 internet users. In just two short years, it had gotten to a point where, to a great number of internet users, it was Gopher or nothing. There simply couldn't be another way to feasibly surf the global network. But of course, as you all know, and at the risk of belaboring the point, this was not to last. In matters of history, when grappling with rise and fall narratives, don't ever let anybody tell you that it was just that one thing that eternal perpetuation was all but inevitable, if not for one key moment that forced a sudden painful disintegration. With the dance of Gopher and the web, it's easy to mythologize what would occur as a face-to-face -face struggle with a single champion and a conquered foe, to say that the web was just too good, just too strong for Gopher to stand beneath the weight of its growing shadow. But that's not entirely true, is it? In reality, as is overwhelmingly often the case, Gopher's slow collapse can be attributed to a number of different factors, all on their own a bit mundane, but as a collective, I think a hell of a lot more interesting. Two events in this category occurred which quickly shifted the dynamics of Gopher use online. Firstly, at GopherCon 93, which took place in April in Minneapolis, University of Michigan announced it would begin charging a licensing fee for all future editions of the software package published by the Gopher team. As it would turn out, since Gopher Server had been available as freeware for the past two years, the Gopher team had remained largely internally funded throughout development, and the university had made the choice to cash in on the popularity of their proprietary technology. In a turn of events which shocked precisely no one, the community's reaction was swift and invariably negative, flooding Gopher space with outrage and turning many off the project entirely. This was not made any better when, in mid-1993, the team posted an inflammatory public address to all Gopher users attempting to justify the imposition of fees. The move, which famously did not work for Bill Gates in 76, flopped comparably for the Gopher team in 93, and as Bob Alberti would put it, socially killed Gopher. At the same time, and a few states away, the University of Illinois' NCSA Lab announced the initial public release of Mosaic, developed by many of the same researchers who would go on to design Netscape Navigator, and widely considered the first commercially successful internet browser. Mosaic offered a bevy of versatile browsing features in a markedly user-friendly graphical package, and, it should be noted, was built to browse the burgeoning World Wide Web not the extant Gopher space. But these factors alone did not kill Gopher, far from it. 
What they did do, however, was create an environment in which Gopher was newly pricey and stained with controversy, whilst the comparatively newer web was unblemished, distinguished by the shine of youth and boasting support from the world's first browser to make front page news. Throughout 1993, uh, Gopher traffic increased by a factor of 10, but for the first time, the growth of the net, and now the World Wide Web, was outpacing it. These changes paved the way for the second category of factors to take effect, slower in pace, but utterly inexorable. Simply put, the internet had changed. Gopher, with its strict form and hierarchy, simple communication protocols, and fully list-based navigation, had found its niche in text-based browsers, campus information systems, and the pre-1993 hobbyist internet. But the web, with its largely form-agnostic nature and free-form linking system in the form of clickable hypertext, seemed with each day ever more suited to the sprawling, disjointed, and endlessly diverse internet of the oncoming 21st century. For the very first time in 1994, the number of web users would surpass that of Gopher, and within another year or two, it was no longer a contest. To quote directly from the Gopher team's youngest developer, Paul Lindner, in an interview with Minnesota Post in 2016, I remember the exact moment I knew I was no longer on the right track. It was September 9th, 1993. I was invited to give a talk about Gopher at Princeton, and I had my slides all printed up on my little university budget black and white foils. The person presenting before me was talking about the future of the web, with full color LCD projection. And I said, I think I see where things are going. But you can't kill a protocol. It doesn't work like that. There are people alive today who still use Telnet. Gopher didn't die, it just went a bit underground, where it continued to persist throughout Y2K and the onset of the 21st century. These days, the original Gopher team is all but moved on from the project, and its modern-day care and feeding is now largely carried out by a California-based man named Cameron Kaiser, owner of Floodgap Systems, whose Gopher server at gopher.floodgap.com now acts as the largest load-bearing junction point in the entirety of Gopher space. Floodgap offers an online Gopher proxy and maintains the Overbyte project, an initiative to regularly release and update modern-day Gopher client and server software that's compatible with contemporary systems. Kaiser has gone on record saying that he believes the web has wandered astray in recent years in terms of overhead, clutter, and bandwidth requirements, and if you use it for any length of time in the present day, you might find yourself agreeing with him. He argues that despite lacking many of the quality of life features and versatility the web has come to possess, Gopher is still entirely viable for many avenues of net surfing and is even superior in certain regards. And if you want to give Gopher a shot, it's honestly not that difficult. A good deal of non-mainline browsers support it, and there's even a handful of up-to-date dedicated browsers that deal in nothing but Gopher. During research for this video, I used links because I'm a dork, but you don't have to do that, and the resources offered by Floodgap make the process of onboarding almost entirely painless. The whole thing, for whatever it's worth, gets my endorsement. I say, try it out. The story of Gopher isn't a story of competition, of wasted potential or ruinous downfalls. It's just another chapter in the still ongoing narrative of the internet, and if you will, a reminder that just because something seems like it's always been and forever will be, doesn't mean that's truly the case. I think these days, that's something kind of important to remember. Thanks for watching, everybody, and uh, have a good night.